Hello everyone, this video lesson covers neurotoxic chemicals which you may encounter in your everyday lives. Yang Wei Fang is the original author of this lesson plan. Support for the development of this video is given by the NSF through funding of the Vote of Knowledge in the Science Classroom Project at Ohio University. This video assumes that the audience has a basic understanding of the nervous system as well as bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Neurotoxins are toxins which act specifically on nerve cells, usually by interacting with membrane proteins such as ion channels. They can cause permanent damage to the neurons and structures of the brain. This means that a neurotoxic chemical is any chemical which adversely affects the nervous system or brain. Neurotoxins exist everywhere within both natural and man-made environments. They can exist naturally in the environment, within the human body, within certain occupational environments, and even in the products which we use on a daily basis. For example, many of the venoms and other toxins that organisms use in defense against predators are neurotoxins. The venom of bees, scorpions, spiders, and snakes can contain many different toxins. Plastic products and household items can also contain many different toxic constituents. In order to protect ourselves against these neurotoxic chemicals, it is important to understand how they behave and where they come from. The toxicity of a substance can be measured by its effects on the target organism, organ, tissue, or cell. Because individuals typically have different levels of response to the same dose of a toxin, a population level measure of toxicity is often used, which relates to the probabilities of an outcome for a given individual within a population. This level is called the median lethal dose, which is the dosage of a substance required to kill half of a tested population after a short test duration. The median lethal dose is frequently used as a general indicator of a substance acute toxicity. For instance, the median lethal dose of caffeine is roughly 150 to 200 milligrams per kilogram of body mass. I weigh around 170 pounds, or about 77 kilograms, so I would need to take roughly 11.5 grams of caffeine before it killed me. This is about 121 cups or 7.5 gallons of coffee. So if you're thinking about chugging eight gallons of coffee, I'd strongly advise against it. On the other hand, toxicity may be measured as a reference dose. This is an estimate of a daily human exposure to a toxic substance that does not cause adverse effects during a lifetime. Reference dose is an indicator of chronic toxicity, meaning that if you exceed the amount of exposure to a toxic substance over the reference dose, it may eventually cause adverse effects. For instance, if you were to consume 0.3 micrograms of arsenic per kilogram of body weight a day, you probably won't experience any negative effects. For a 77 kilogram person, this adds up to 23.1 micrograms a day. However, I would strongly advise that you don't willingly do this to yourself. For the dose response graph on the right, the reference dose would represent the part of the curve to the left of the first data point, around 8, while the median dose corresponds to about 20, where the response to the substance is around 50%. The most vulnerable age groups to neurotoxic chemicals are children and the elderly. Critical neurodevelopmental processes occur in the human central nervous system during fetal development in the first three years after birth. Organ growth occurs in spurs, and it is during key growth periods that organ systems are, more, are most vulnerable to permanent damage. Young children are also at increased risk for exposure to environmental toxins because they exhibit a high degree of hand-to-mouth activity that increases their chances of ingesting paint chips, house dust, and soil that is contaminated with lead, insecticides, or other toxins. The elderly are at risk because of declining liver and kidney functions, as well as the gradual loss of neurons as part of the aging process. Lead is a neurotoxic metal widely used in building construction, lead acid batteries, and bullets. Lead interferes with the release of glutamate, a neurotransmitter important in many functions including learning, by blocking NMDA receptors. This leads to a loss of the neuron's myelin sheaths, a reduction in the number of neurons, and decreased neuronal growth. The picture shows regions in the brain with significant volume loss in adults associated with childhood lead exposure. The volume loss is shown with red and yellow clusters overlaid upon a standard brain template viewed at multiple angles. 
Damage caused by lead exposure of small quantities over time includes impaired motor development, growth retardation, delayed nerve conduction, learning disabilities, and behavioral problems. High lead concentrations in the body may lead to seizures, coma, and even death. In a historical study, lead poisoning in children was found to be one of the strongest predictors of criminal behavior in adults. There is no known amount of lead that is too small to cause the body harm. From the CDC and WHO, a blood lead level of 10 micrograms per deciliter is a cause for concern. The largest sources of lead exposure include lead-based paints and corrosion of pipes containing lead. Federal law requires that contractors performing renovation, repair, and painting projects that disturb more than six square feet of paint in homes, child care facilities, and schools built before 1978 must be certified and trained to follow specific work practices to prevent lead contamination. To minimize lead exposure from pipes, it is a good idea to contact your municipal water supplier to make sure lead concentration in the distribution networks are at acceptable levels. Additionally, you may wish to test your tap water at home for lead or invest in additional water filtration treatment at the home level. Mercury is a neurotoxic metal that has been used in products such as light bulbs, batteries, paint, and thermometers. Syphilis was frequently treated with mercuric chloride before the advent of antibiotics. The primary man-made sources of mercury pollution are coal-burning power plants. There are many different forms of mercury, but the organic form of mercury, known as methylmercury, is the most toxic form. The neurotoxic impacts of mercury exposure include the targeting and destruction of neurons in specific areas of the brain, such as the visual cortex and cerebellum. This is done through protein inhibition and disruption of neurotransmitters. Additionally, methylmercury can be combined with a kind of amino acid to produce a chemical that is recognized by our body as methionine, an essential amino acid. This allows it to be transported freely across the blood-brain barrier as well as across the placenta in pregnant women. Damage caused by the exposure of low levels of mercury includes deficits in neuromotor performance, cognition, memory, and language. At high doses, mercury may lead to mental retardation, spastic paralysis, and death. The current reference dose of methylmercury is 0.1 microgram per kilogram of body mass per day. It is estimated that more than 600,000 infants are exposed to excessive levels of mercury. The main sources of mercury exposure are through the consumption of fish and other seafood, dental amalgams, cosmetic products, other foods, and fluorescent light bulbs. Tooth cavities are most often filled with dental amalgam. Dental amalgam is made with several different materials, including silver, tin, copper, and mercury. The American Dental Association has reviewed the literature and has concluded that dental amalgam is a safe way to repair teeth. The U.S. Public Health Service, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Food and Drug Administration have reached similar conclusions. However, a paper published by the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2005 did list dental amalgams as a source of mercury exposure. Additionally, some skin whitening products contain the toxic chemical mercury chloride as the active ingredient. The use of mercury in cosmetics is illegal in the United States. However, cosmetics containing mercury are often illegally imported. To minimize your exposure to mercury, check fish advisories for your state and limit your consumption of seafood. Fish advisories are warnings that the fish in a certain body of water are contaminated with mercury and should not be eaten. Additionally, avoid any cosmetics which may contain mercury. A pesticide is any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pests. The most common subclasses of pesticides include herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, and rodenticides. Although very useful in, in increasing agricultural productivity, nearly all synthetic insecticides have the potential to significantly alter ecosystems, and many are toxic to humans. Many insecticides are actually designed to be neurotoxic. 
About 1 billion pounds of pesticides are used annually in the United States, and over 16,000 kinds of pesticide products are being marketed in the United States. The EPA estimates that among 2 million agricultural workers in the United States, 10,000 to 20,000 of them have been diagnosed by phys physicians with pesticide poisoning. 10 out of the 12 most dangerous and persistent organic chemicals are actually pesticides. Next to lead and tobacco smoke, insecticides probably represent the most common environmental neurotoxin in U.S. homes. Prominent insecticide families are defined by molecular composition and action of insect destruction. These include organochlorines, organophosphates, and carbamates. Organochlorines are insecticides composed primarily of carbon, hydrogen, and chlorine. They break down slowly and can remain in the environment long after application and in organisms long after exposure. The most notorious organochlorine is DDT. Organochlorine insecticides have been phased out due to their persistence in the environment. Organophosphates are organic compounds that contain carbon-phosphorus bonds. They were first discovered as potential insecticides in the 1930s, where they were then used as nerve gas during World War II. These compounds degrade faster but have greater acute toxicity than organochlorines. Carbamates are fast-acting insecticides with similar toxicity and function to organophosphates. The most notorious insecticide is the organochlorine DDT, or dichloral diaphenyl trichloroethane. Promoted as a cure-all insecticide in the 1940s, DDT was widely used in agricultural production around the world for many years. It was also the chemical of choice for mosquito control. Until the 1960s, trucks sprayed DDTs in neighborhoods across the United States. DDT was also the primary weapon in the global war against malaria during this period, and continues to be used for malaria control in a handful of countries. In 1962, American biologist Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring. This book cataloged the environmental impacts of indiscriminate DDT use in the United States, and question the logic to, of releasing large amounts of chemicals into the environment without fully understanding their effects on the environment or human health. This book produced a large public outcry that led to a 1972 ban in the United States. DDT was subsequently banned for agricultural use worldwide under the Stockholm Convention, but limited, controversial use in disease vector control continues. Organophosphates and carbamates inhibit a type of enzyme that helps to degrade the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, leading to an increase in the brain of acetylcholine. Increases in acetylcholine activity causes a decreased heart rate and increased production of saliva, as well as readying the muscles for work. In high doses, it can cause convulsions and tremors. In most circumstances, acetylcholine is removed quickly by the action of this enzyme. When the enzyme is inhibited by insecticides, it causes a continued stimulation of the muscles, glands, and central nervous system, which eventually leads to paralysis and stopping of the heartbeat. A study conducted by Harvard School of Public Health last year found that children with high levels of pesticide breakdown products in their bodies were almost twice as likely to develop ADHD as those with undetectable levels. Sources of pesticide exposure include aerosols from spraying of agricultural fields, residues left on produce, and in the usage of household pesticides. In order to minimize exposure, wash produce thoroughly, eat fruits and vegetables with little residue, or use natural pesticides or alternative methods for pest removal. Do you know what those numbers on the bottom of plastic bottles and container indicate? These are plastic identification codes and they identify the plastic resin from which a plastic product was made. A number one signifies products made out of polyethylene terephthalate, which includes soda and water bottles. A number two signifies high-density polyethylene and includes rigid plastic items like milk jugs and butter tubs. A number three signifies polyvinyl chloride plastics and includes products like detergent and shampoo bottles. A number four signifies low-density polyethylene and includes frozen food bags and clean films. A number five signifies polypropylene and includes items like syrup and ketchup bottles. A number six signifies polystyrene and includes items like styrofoam and disposable plates and cups. And a number seven signifies other plastics and includes items like beverage bottles and baby bottles. 
Bisphenol A is a neurotoxic chemical used in the manufacture of number three and number seven plastics. Studies have shown that low doses of BPA during development have persistent effects on brain structure, function, and behavior in rats and mice. BPA could induce significant adverse effects on memory processes, interfere with brain cell connections vital to learning and mood, and could be involved in the development of ADHD within humans. The reference dose for BPA is 0.05 mg per kilogram of body mass per day. Sources of exposure to BPA include beverage or fruit containers made out of number three and number seven plastics, food can linings, and receipts. To minimize exposure to BPA, the National Institute of Health suggests not to microwave or machine wash food containers made out of number three or number seven plastic, reduce the use of canned food, and purchase BPA-free baby bottles and toys. In conclusion, the human body can suffer exposure to countless chemical stressors, only a small number of which are regulated. Rarely is any organism exposed to but a single chemical stressor at any time in isolation from all the others. All organisms have evolved a complex repertoire of defense mechanisms for coping with exposure to those chemicals foreign to their normal existence. Living systems have developed protective, defensive, or adaptive mechanisms for minimizing the exposure or even the toxicity of many of the otherwise harmful, naturally occurring chemicals. However, for those new chemicals that have only recently emerged and to which biological systems have never been exposed, these defense mechanisms sometimes can prove to be inadequate. For additional resources, an exploration activity is included along with this lesson plan where students can extract natural pesticides from different plants and spices to see which is the most effective in killing flies. To learn more about toxicity, check out the book's toxicology video developed by Ivan Caballero and Sean Krupta. To learn more about bioaccumulation, check out the book's bioaccumulation video by Ebenezer Luma and Derek Smetzer. Thank you for listening.